Castillo. Well, the U.S. Senate continues working today on its transportation bill, setting federal highway and transit programs and policy for the next two years. That bill has been stalled during negotiations over unrelated amendments. And now live to the Senate floor. Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our comfort and guide, as we begin this day in the forward march of history, we acknowledge your sovereignty your unfailing love and mercy continue to sustain us and we put our hope in you today fill our lawmakers with your wisdom enabling them to shoulder the demands of decisions the strain of conflict and the uncertainties about tomorrow. Let your justice guide their thoughts and your righteousness direct their steps. Fill them with your joy and use them for your glory. Make each of us a blessing and not a burden a lift and not a load, a delight and not a drag. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., February 29, 2012. To the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Kirsten E. Gillibrand, a Senator from the State of New York, to perform the duties of the Chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Madam President. Majority Leader. The following Leader remarks the Senate being a period of morning business for an hour. Republicans will control the first half. The majority will control the second half. Following that biz morning business, the Senate will resume consideration of the highway bill. We continue to work on a process to complete action on this bill. We're going to have to do that. If we can't get an agreement, uh, to move forward on this bill, I have no alternative but to try to stop the filibuster that's taking place. I hope we don't have to do that. We've agreed to work on amendments that aren't relevant or germane. Uh, Senator Durbin of WIP has worked on uh, side-by-sides and other amendments, so we're ready to move forward. But we can't do it unless we get some basic cooperation. And it's a shame if we can't move forward on this bipartisan bill. I ask consent that floor privileges be granted to Andy Remo and Jesse Holliday, two of Senator Cardin's legislative staff members, during today's session of the Senate. Without objection. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for an hour. Senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republican controlling, Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the second half. Madam President, uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum. I, before I do, can I make an inquiry? Will the time be running on the uh, minority party's first half hour? The senator is correct. Well, I suggest the absence of a quorum until a member of the minority appears. Kirk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Just getting the day started here in the Senate as we await uh, the arrival of a re Republican member to come to the floor to discuss uh, the work that's going to take place today in the Senate. Work uh, today on the transportation bill, setting federal highway and transit programs and policy for the next couple of years. The bill has been stalled during negotiations over unrelated amendments. Senators did agree yesterday to vote on an amendment by uh, Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri dealing with contraception and insurance coverage. The amendment lets employers decline to provide coverage if they're morally against it. That vote is planned for tomorrow, and when we find out when that uh, is to take place, we will let you know. The House will be in session today. They'll be debating a bill to eliminate environmental protections of some fish in uh, California's San Joaquin Valley and to change water distribution there. The House will gavel in this morning at 10. You can see live coverage on C-SPAN.
Madam President. Senator from South Dakota. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Madam President, um, back in 2008, then Senator Obama said that under his policies, energy costs would necessarily, and I quote, skyrocket, skyrocket, end quote, and that he would, and I quote again, have preferred a gradual adjustment to higher gasoline prices. So he, he indicated at the time that under his policies, energy prices were going to go up. He mentioned that he would like a more gradual adjustment, but uh, when he talked about those policies, he said that energy costs would necessarily, and I quote, skyrocket. Well, I think that we now know, Madam President, which of the campaign promises that the president has kept, because we have seen energy prices skyrocket for most Americans. In fact, gasoline prices have doubled under President Obama's watch. If you look at 19, or January of 2009, the price per gallon of gasoline was $1.85. Uh, today it's $3.73, and some analysts are predicting $5 a gallon gasoline by May of this year. Now, today marks the 24th straight day of gasoline price increases. Now, the problem with all this, Madam President, is that the President rhetorically, when he goes out and talks about energy, says that he wants an all-of-the-above strategy. Now, they always say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and obviously that is a, a phrase that many of us as Republicans have been using for some time. We talk about an all-of-the-above strategy that includes oil and gas and clean coal and, and nuclear and biofuels and solar and wind and all of those things. The, the, the problem with what the President says is that his accident, actions say that he really means none of the above. He says all of the above, but he means none of the above because the president has taken unprecedented steps to restrict access to America's affordable and reliable sources of oil and natural gas. President Obama's energy policies are increasing the cost of gasoline in this country. His administration is pursuing new regulations that will increase the cost of domestic energy production and destroy jobs. Madam President, more domestic production of energy in this country equals lower prices at the pump and more American jobs. Now, the, the President's uh, statements have been punctuated, if you will, or reinforced by members of his, his administration. Again, I go back to 2008, Dr. Stephen Chu, who is now President Obama's energy secretary, said at the time, and I quote, somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe, end quote. Think about that, Madam President. Somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. Well, if you look at the levels in Europe, I think even at that time, you were talking about $9 to $10 per gallon of gasoline. And so you have members of his very administration uh, suggesting, Madam President, even back then, that part of the strategy, the energy strategy, was to increase prices. Think about that, as having an energy strategy that is actually going to drive up the cost of energy to people in this country. Well, yesterday, in testimony before the House Appropriations Committee, uh, now Secretary Hsu, who said back in 2008 that somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe, was asked, is the, but is the overall goal to get uh, the price of gasoline down? That was asked by a member of the House of Representatives uh, again, as uh, Secretary Chu is testifying in front of the House Appropriations Committee, is the overall goal to get our price of gasoline down? This is what the Secretary said. No. The overall goal is to decrease our dependency on oil to build and strengthen our economy. Well, Madam President, when you are doubling, literally doubling the price per gallon of gasoline, how does that strengthen your economy? Small businesses are faced every single day with high costs of energy, it's an important part and an important component of running a business in this country. Energy is probably one of the most, Im most important costs that people are going to deal with. It certainly is in my part of the country where I represent an agricultural economy. But American families are looking at gasoline prices that literally have doubled uh, since this president took office. And yet, here is Secretary of Energy, the very guy who was to guide energy policy in this country, in front of a House committee as recently as yesterday when asked about the overall goal 
says that uh, about what are the overall goals to get the price of gasoline down, says no. No. It squares perfectly with what he said four years ago when he indicated that we need to figure out how to somehow boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. Well, that is an amazing, amazing statement. I think probably almost incomprehensible to the American people in terms of what it, uh, uh, what it means uh, to their daily lives because they're the people who ultimately in their pocketbooks have to deal with the consequences of bad policies. And bad policies that raise the price of, of energy in this country uh, makes it more difficult for them to balance their budgets and to be able to, uh, to continue to enjoy a standard of living and a quality of life in this country. Yesterday, President Obama, Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, defending the, defended the Obama administration's failure of an energy policy uh, when testifying before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And he said this, he said, we have an energy strategy, strategy I'm sorry, and a policy that we've been working on from day one. And we believe it continues to show good results. Now think about that. We have an energy strategy and a policy that we've been working on from day one. We believe it continues to show good results. Well, I don't know how you can argue that doubling the price for a gallon of gasoline is a good result and literally taking um, areas out of production in this country that could be yielding uh, energy that would help reduce the dependence that we have on foreign sources of energy, drive down the price at the pump, and create American jobs is a good result. I don't know how you can argue uh, that the things that, that, that have happened here in the, uh, during this administration's time in office have been anything but disastrous for the American people, for American business, and for the continued dependence that we have on foreign sources of energy. Of course, we all know that President Obama rejected the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have created 20,000 shovel-ready jobs and delivered up to 830,000 barrels of oil per day from Canada, America's largest trading partner. Uh, President Obama has reduced the number of new offshore leases by half, by half. President Obama has blocked exploration and production on 97% of offshore areas. 97% of those areas that could be useful in helping meet America's energy needs have been put off, off, off limits uh, by this president, by, by their policies, which have, have blocked exploration and production in those very areas. Under the Obama administration, new permits to drill in federal onshore and offshore areas have declined by 40 to 50 percent. That, Madam President, is the President's record on energy. So how his Secretary of the Interior could come up and say that their energy strategy shows good results is beyond me. I mean, it is completely at odds uh, with the reality and with the facts, uh, Madam President. The Obama administration is implementing a backdoor, national backdoor energy tax through unprecedented regulations of greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. In fact, President Obama specifically targeting the oil and gas industry with new regulations such as new source performance standards, uh, Boiler Act, tier three gasoline standards that could drive up the cost of gasoline production by up to 25 cents a gallon could raise the refining industry's operating costs by $5 billion to $13 billion annually, lead to a 7 to 14 percent reduction in gasoline supplies from U.S. refiners and force as many as seven U.S. refiners to shut down. That's the, the Tier 3 gasoline standard that the administration is proposing. And so time after time again, uh, opportunity after opportunity missed, now, this president continues to put policies in place that make it more difficult, more expensive to create jobs in this country, and that raise the cost of doing business by raising the cost of energy and raising the cost that every uh, American consumer has to deal with in the form of higher gasoline prices. So when he says that he supports an all, abo all the above energy plan, his policies tell, Madam President, a very, very different story because his policies have discouraged increased production of oil, and high oil costs are indeed a driver, a key driver of gasoline costs. Republicans support a real all of the above strategy uh, that includes production in all of, the, of all the sources of energy, uh, includes support of projects like the Keystone XL pipeline that will strengthen North America's energy security. And we've got to have a robust energy plan that's focused on increasing those areas of domestic production that would send a strong signal to energy markets around the world and make America less vulnerable to skyrocketing gasoline prices. It's interesting, uh, Madam President, that the, the response up here on Capitol Hill to this spike in gasoline prices that we have seen here over the past several days uh, is, is along these lines. 
There was a letter that went from Senator Schumer to Secretary Clinton a couple of days ago in which uh, he talked about the skyrocketing fuel prices, uh, directly linked those to the global energy market, but suggested that the solution should be urging the State Department to work with the government of Saudi Arabia to increase its oil production to its actual capacity of 12.5 million barrels to help stabilize markets. So instead, instead of developing American resources and, and actually doing something that would lessen the dependence that we have on these foreign sources of energy, the solution proposed by some of our, at least of our Democrat colleagues, is to go to the, have the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, go to the Saudis, hat in hand, and to beg them to increase daily production by two and a half million barrels. Ironically, at the very time that they are blocking policies that would help generate that same two and a half million barrels a day right here in the United States and stabilize world markets. In fact, if you look at many of these areas that are off limits to production today, North Slope of Alaska, the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf, the Eastern Gulf of Mexico, the Pacific Outer Continental Shelf, the Keystone XL Pipeline. If you add up, Madam President, the amount of production that that would bring to, uh, to our country, it adds up to four and a half million barrels per day. Four and a half million barrels per day of additional energy production that we could be benefiting from and enjoying in this country uh, at a time when we're seeing gas prices literally double. And, of course, in, 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 uh, in accordance with the President's promise when he was running for office that prices were going to skyrocket, uh, it shouldn't come as any surprise. But these energy policies implemented by this administration and have literally uh, created a situation where we're now having to go and ask the Saudis, please, please, would you please give us an additional two and a half million barrels of oil a day uh, instead of opening up the areas in this country that could generate up to four and a half million barrels per day if we would simply develop the resources that we have in this country and quit blocking, quit blocking uh, the access to these important energy resources. Madam President, this is a fairly straightforward issue to the American people. One, because it hits very squarely in their everyday lives. Uh, the, the, the pocketbook issues are issues, the bread and butter issues, the issues that people discuss around their kitchen tables every day are, are the issues that I think are most important to Americans, particularly right now in a down economy with a high unemployment rate. And certainly what we're seeing in terms of energy costs uh, makes worse that situation uh, for American families. In fact, uh, the payroll tax holiday, which was extended um, a couple of weeks ago, will actually be eaten up. Any savings that might be achieved to the American family's pocketbooks will literally be eaten up simply paying for the higher cost of gasoline that is going to be imposed on every American family as a result of these higher prices, again, that are simply a matter of us not having enough supply. This is a, this is a, a market situation. Gasoline is a global commodity. It is something that uh, when you have more supply, it brings the price down. And when you've got more domestic production in this country, it means two things. It means lower prices at the pump for American consumers, and it means more jobs for American workers. And blocking access to American sources of energy production means higher prices at the pump for American consumers and fewer jobs for American workers. It is that straightforward, it is that simple. The American people understand that, and that's why the policies that this administration is pursuing, and clearly, Madam President, from the statements that are being made by these members of the President's administration, from Secretary Hsu to Secretary Salazar to the President himself, suggest, suggest, if you can believe this, unfathomable, I'm sure, to many Americans, that it is intentional to actually push those prices higher. That is what Secretary Chu said back in 2008. We need to boost our prices to the level that they're seeing in places like Europe. I think the American people believe differently about that. I believe they deserve better. Uh, they want policies that will lower the cost of energy in this country, make America less dependent upon uh, dangerous foreign, foreign regimes. And I know that uh, many of us here, Republicans in the Senate, are ready to go to work on putting those policies in place if the President and his, his allies here in the United States Senate will give us that opportunity. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President.
The Republican leader. I want to associate myself with the remarks of the senator from South Dakota and follow up uh, as, uh, in that regard. Uh, yesterday, I came to the Senate floor and explained how the president's ideological outlook and the policies that have grown out of it will only continue to drive up the cost of gasoline at the pump. And after I spoke, the president's energy secretary seemed to confirm it when he told a congressional panel that the Department of Energy isn't working to drive down the price of gas. They're working to wean us off of it altogether. And that high gas prices add urgency to those efforts. In other words, high gas prices actually help the administration achieve what it is trying to achieve. What I suggested yesterday and what I'm suggesting again this morning is that we look at statements like this and many others from the president and some of his top advisors in the past, along with the president's actual policies when it comes to assessing the current situation at the pump, not the speeches he gives when he starts feeling the political heat for it, because he can't have it both ways. So once again, here are the facts. The president continues to limit offshore areas to energy production and is granting fewer leases on public land for oil drilling. At the same time, he has encouraged other countries like Brazil to move forward with their offshore drilling projects. <clears throat> the Obama administration continues to impose burdensome regulations on the domestic energy sector that will further drive up the cost of gasoline for the consumer. He's proposing raising taxes on the energy sector, a move that the Congressional Research Service has said would drive up costs. And as we all know, he fully rejected the Keystone XL pipeline a potentially game-changing domestic energy project that promises not only greater independence from the Middle Eastern oil, but tens of thousands of private sector jobs. Now, all of these policies help drive up the cost of gasoline and increase our dependence on foreign sources of oil. But perhaps none is as emblematic of the President's simplistic and punitive approach to energy policy as the last one. The President simply can't claim to support comprehensive approach to energy while at the same time standing in the way of the Keystone Pipeline. It doesn't make any sense. It's either one or the other. Now, most Americans understand that. And that's why many of us were pleased when the company that's responsible for building Keystone said it plans to move forward with the southern portion of the pipeline despite the administration's <coughs> decision to block the northern portion to alleviate a bottleneck in Cushing, Oklahoma. They're just not going to let this administration punish them or the rest who want to build this uh, pipeline. Ask about the impact of delays. The company's president and CEO said they were partly to blame for the recent spike in gas prices, which is presumably why the White House came out in support of the move. But the hypocrisy here is really quite stunning. I mean, how could the White House that is single-handedly blocking one half of the pipeline to appease an extreme segment of its political base now claim to support the southern half of the same pipeline? Well, the short answer is they don't have the authority to block the southern half, so they think that by claiming to support it, then can get credit from people for being on both sides of the issue. But if Keystone is good for America and good for jobs, the president should just come out and support the whole pipeline. With gas prices literally skyrocketing and growing turmoil in the Middle East, we can't afford another year of foot dragging. It's time for the president to move quickly to approve the entire Keystone XL pipeline. This is literally a no-brainer. An overwhelming majority of Americans support the Keystone XL pipeline in its entirety. The president should listen to them. Instead of lecturing the American people about his idea of fairness, he should spend a little more time thinking about what most Americans think is fair. Look, <clears throat> most Americans don't think it's particularly fair that the President of the United States is blocking them from tapping into our natural resources, even as he uses their tax dollars to prop up failing solar companies like Solyndra and to hand out bonuses to the executives that drive them literally into the ground. Most Americans don't think it's fair that their president would want to drive up the cost of gasoline they need to get around every day and build their families and their businesses and their lives, even as he's directing more and more of their money to risky solar schemes 
in his own administration. These risky solar schemes, his own administration says, sometimes fail. Well, the American people don't ask for much, but they do expect to be able to go out there every day and try to build a future for themselves and for their families without their own president throwing sand in the gears. And whether it's high gas prices or government regulations or higher debt, the American people are tired of bearing the burden so this president can build an economy in which Washington calls all the shots. Yes, Americans want lower gas prices. And yes, this president's policies are hurting. But let's be clear about something. This debate isn't just about gas prices. It's about a president who wants to impose a definition of fairness on the American people that most of them simply do not accept. Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I should ask consent that I be permitted to finish my remarks uh, and I'll be granted enough time to do so. Uh, without objection. Thank you. Madam President, the first three years of President Obama's administration were a frenzy of activity. He pushed the stimulus. He spent over a year pursuing his health care law. He forced through Dodd-Frank, imposing historic regulations on the banking industry. Even The Economist magazine has found fault with that. Yet at a time when the nation was in economic freefall, the President chose an agenda of more regulation and higher taxes. The President ignored private sector job creation and the primacy of economic growth. And nowhere was this more evident than with respect to energy policy. President Obama has failed entirely to address one of the greatest obstacles to the economic growth, and that is high energy prices. Today he claims that he is for an all of a sudden approach to energy. All of a sudden, facing $5 a gallon gasoline, weak job creation, and a presidential election, he claims to have found religion on uh, energy production. But whether we look at oil, natural gas, or the Keystone Pipeline, the American people are not buying this conversion story. And I certainly agree with our distinguished minority leader in his comments here this morning. This failure by the president to tackle our energy needs as a national crisis for which the American people should hold him to account. Yet his inability to put jobs ahead of his radical and unrepresentative environmental base has particular implications for the citizens of my state of Utah as well. Days after announcing in his State of the Union an, quote, all of the above strategy that develops every available source of American energy, unquote, the administration cut access to federal lands in the West for oil shale development by 75 percent and proposed a 50 percent royalty hike on domestic energy production on public lands. Whether it is closing off more federal lands uh, to American energy production or saying no to the Keystone Pipeline, this White House has shown that it is more focused on appeasing its extremist ideological allies than putting forward an energy policy that works for Utahns and Americans everywhere. With gas prices and home heating costs on the rise, the American people deserve action, not more campaign speeches. And I might add from the most anti-American energy administration in our nation's history. When it comes to energy policy, the president is a man divided. On almost all economic policy, his answer is tax the rich more. Taxing the rich more is his go-to option for reducing the deficit, paying for Obamacare, and paying for new roads and bridges. Higher taxes are a matter of fundamental fairness, the president claims. But when it comes to gas prices, the president sides with the 1%. The folks who would benefit most from increased energy production are blue-collar workers and middle-class families. High energy prices hit the wallets of lower-income Americans the hardest. Middle-class Americans are more likely to have longer commutes and bigger cars than wealthy urban citizens. The pass-through cost of high fuel prices hits the grocery budgets of all Americans. And the jobs that never materialize due to the failure to develop energy resources undermine every blue-collar American. The President's claims to be for fairness and the egalitarian 
He claims to be for fairness and an and egalitarian economic policy. But his energy policy is incredibly regressive, putting the burden of his environmental agenda on the backs of the middle class. The situation got no better with the budget that the president recently submitted or with his long-delayed proposal for business tax reform. Rather than advance an enemy agenda that would spur production, lower prices, and create jobs, the president continues to advocate for increased taxes on oil and gas production in the United States. On March 3rd of last year, the Congressional Research Service concluded that the president's proposals would, quote, make oil and natural gas more expensive for U.S. consumers and likely increase foreign dependence, unquote. The same holds true today. These decisions are based in political appeals to his elitist base rather than interest in developing sound energy policy. For example, in his budget, the president cites the following for his reason, as his reason for repealing tax incentives for oil and gas production. Quote, special gas treatment of working interests in oil and gas properties distorts markets by encouraging more investment in the oil and gas industry that would occur under a neutral system, unquote. Give me a break. The reason the president opposes current tax policy for oil and gas is because he opposes distorting markets? The Energy Information Administration reports that in fiscal year 2010, $14.7 billion in energy-specific subsidies went to advance renewable energy compared to $4.2 billion in energy-related subsidies that went to advance fossil fuels. In other words, there are three times as many government subsidies going to renewable energy than there are going to oil, gas, and coal combined. Now, that's what you call distorting the market. Contrary to the President's presentation, these are not tax loopholes that need to be closed. The term tax loophole implies that a tax incentive is susceptible to an exploitation of an unintended benefit. While the tax code has some tax loopholes that we must clearly eliminate, the tax expenditures that benefit oil and gas companies were intended to incentivize a particular activity or behavior. For instance, Section 199 of the Internal Revenue Code includes an incentive for the domestic production of oil and gas. This is no loophole. Congress, on a bipartisan basis, understands that without this incentive, we could see an enormous reduction in employment. And it is simply inaccurate to state that this incentive adds little to our eco economic or energy security. The American people need to understand that repeal of this policy will only increase our dependence on foreign produced oil. But this does not seem to bother the president one bit. On March 20th last year, the president told a group of political and business leaders in Brazil that we, quote, want to help with technology and support to develop these oil reserves safely. And when you're ready to start selling, we want to be one of your best customers, unquote. As hard as it is to believe, the administration does not even seem to share the desire of, Amer of the American people for lower energy prices. The President's Secretary of Energy, Secretary Stephen Chu, has stated, quote, we have to figure out how to boost the price of gas gasoline to the levels in Europe, unquote. Madam President, gas prices in Europe are eight to ten dollars a gallon, and that is where the administration and environmental activists want gas prices to be for Americans. Even President Obama stated in 2008 that he would prefer a gradual adjustment to high gasoline prices just maybe not a quick spike. The president claims that he is for an all of the above energy policy so long as it does not include offshore drilling, drilling on our western lands, the development of energy in Alaska, and the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> Why reading of his all of the above approach is some of the above and only those that are poll tested and approved by environmental accident, uh, activists. This is terrible tax policy. It is terrible energy policy. And it is terrible economic policy. Unfortunately, it is all we have from this administration. The reality is that our country relies upon oil and gas because it is dependable, abundant, affordable, and domestic. 
Raising taxes on American companies that produce oil and gas will be felt by all Americans, not only at the pump, but also through a decrease in dividends to many middle-class shareholders. This is the wrong prescription for our ailing economy. For this administration, the goal remains not lower energy prices, but the liberal dream of getting America off of oil. Just the other day, the President's Secretary of Energy acknowledged that the overall goal of his department is not to lower the cost of traditional energy, but to decrease dependency on oil. For what it is worth, this commitment to restricting domestic production is a policy that divides my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. They know that the President is putting the preferred lifestyle policies of wealthy urbanites ahead of the needs of blue-collar and union workers and middle-class Americans. They know that the decision by the President to kill the Keystone Pipeline put environmental interest groups ahead of the needs of workers, commuters, and families. President Obama has traded in the hard hat and lunch bucket category of the Democratic Party for a hipster fedora and a double skim latte. He has put liberal environmental dreams ahead of the economic reality that working class Americans have been struggling with for years. The nation's unemployment rate has been above 8% for 36 straight months. The average duration of an unemployment was 40.1 weeks in January 2012. Yet the President and his allies in the Senate have helped to kill projects that would undeniably lead to the creation of hundreds of thousands of high-paying American jobs. Gas prices have now risen for 20 straight days. Gas prices are now up 30, 30 cents over the last month and 18 cents in the past two weeks and 100 percent since he took over. We are cruising toward $5 a gallon gas and the President resists any long-term solutions to these rising energy prices. The American people deserve better than this. They have waited three long years for, serious energy, for a serious energy agenda from this president. And if he does not address this energy crisis soon, in less than a year, the American people will be looking to another president to promote an energy program that will finally create jobs and lower the cost of energy for all Americans. Look. We have the energy within our country's boundaries and offshore that are still within our country's boundaries. We have the energy that is just begging to be developed that would help us to make it through these trying times. And at the same time, maybe help in some of the other forms of energy development that, that not only the President would like, but I would like and others as well. But we have got to have uh, as, uh, as low-cost energy as we can possibly have, and we're not going to get it under this president. We're not going to get it under this administration. And I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle wake up and realize that we're putting our country right down the drain. I just saw this, this last couple of weeks, The Economist magazine front page of that magazine criticizes us for the over-regulatory nature of our economy and of our government. We're making it so it's almost impossible for businesses to really make the money and income that they need to make to have high-paid jobs in this society. And yet all we hear are, are various approaches that really don't work. Madam President, we can solve our own energy needs. We have between 800 billion and 1.6 trillion barrels of recoverable oil in oil shale in Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming alone. We have billions of barrels of oil in Anwar up in Alaska, billions of barrels of oil in other sites in Alaska. Fortunately, we found oil in the Bakken claim in North Dakota. But the only reason we've been able to drill there is because it's private land. And fortunately, we found some big plays down in Texas. Again, the only reason we're able to do that there is because it's private land. You can't get the permits and the ability to drill on public land or even develop oil shell on public land. Yes, it would cost us more per gallon, more per barrel uh, to, to develop that oil, but it would also bring down the intense problems that we have in trying to find enough oil and gas to keep our country moving 
moving ahead and continue as the greatest country in the world. We have got simply to get this administration to wake up and realize there are many ways we can solve our problems, many ways. We also are awash in natural gas. A lot of people have been saying we need to develop our natural gas. We need to convert those 8 million trucks to natural gas vehicles. We need to develop a natural gas grid, grid, and we need to develop more of our energy resources than we're developing now. And we can do it. America can do it if we get the government off the backs of those who produce energy. And I just hope and pray that Democrats and Republicans of life will lock arms, get together, and let's solve these problems for our country, regardless of what this president, who doesn't seem to know practically what to do or how to do it. Madam President, uh, this is a crucial time for our country. There's no excuse for us to be in the mess we're in. And a lot of it is because of the poor energy policy of this administration. Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from uh, Michigan. Madam President, there's been a great deal of conversation recently about the need to close tax loopholes. This is a welcome development for those of us who have gone after these loopholes for years. It is particularly timely as the public is focusing more and more on how tax loopholes distort economic incentives and often benefit the wealthiest among us at the expense of most U.S. taxpayers. Last week, President Obama released a framework for business tax reform that took aim at many corporate tax loopholes. And I look forward to working with the administration and with our colleagues in the Senate to make real reform a reality, reform that brings greater fairness to the tax code eliminates incentives for moving jobs and assets overseas, restores revenue loss to unjustified tax loopholes, and helps us reduce the deficit without damaging vital programs for education, transportation, health care, and national security. Now, one recent and very public announcement illustrates dramatically our tax code's distortions and the need for reform. At the center of this story, is Facebook and its founder and CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. Mr. Zuckerberg and his company have become a remarkable American business success story. As part of that success, Facebook is in the process of making its initial public offering of stock. The public documents that Facebook is required to file as part of that offering tell another compelling story about one of our tax codes unjustified corporate loopholes. According to its filings, when Facebook goes public, Mr. Zuckerberg plans to exercise options to purchase 120 million shares of stock for six cents a share. Mr. Zuckerberg's shares, obviously, are going to be worth a great deal more than six cents each, or a total of about seven million dollars. They will apparently be worth in the neighborhood of five billion dollars. Now, here's where the tax loophole comes in. Under current law, Facebook can, perfectly legally, tell investors and the public and regulators that the stock options that he received cost the company a mere six cents a share. That's the expense shown on the company's books. But the company can also, perfectly legally, later on file a tax return claiming that those same options cost the company something close to what the shares actually sell for later on, perhaps $40 a share. And the company can take a tax deduction for that far larger amount. So the books show a highly profitable company, profitable in part because of the relatively small expense that the company shows on its books for the stock options that it grants to its employees. But when it comes time to pay taxes, to pay Uncle Sam, the loophole in the tax code allows the company to take a tax deduction for a far larger expense than they've shown on their books. Now, in addition, Facebook is allowed by law to carry back the so-called loss arising from this deduction for two years into the past which means that it can claim a tax refund 
for the income tax that it has paid over the past two years, a refund that the company estimates at half a billion dollars. So instead of paying taxes to the Treasury, this profitable company will claim a hefty refund on the taxes already paid. But that's not all. The company says that it will, as allowed by law, also carry forward the so-called losses arising from this tax deduction for over 20 years into the future, thereby reducing any tax that it owes in the years ahead. Altogether, this loophole could give Facebook a tax break of up to $3 billion. Now, the end result is that a profitable U.S. corporation, a success story, could end up paying no taxes at all for years, even decades. Now, I emphasize that Facebook's actions are within the law. As with so much of our tax code, it's not the law breaking that shocks the conscience. It's the stuff that's perfectly legal. For years, my permanent subcommittee on investigations has identified this stock option loophole and tried to explain its cost, its unfairness, and why it should be closed. Facebook's $3 billion tax break brings the issue into sharp focus. And again, the stock option loophole allows corporations to compensate their executives with stock options, report a specific stock option expense to their shareholders, and then later take a tax deduction for typically a much higher amount. Stock option grants are the only kind of compensation where the tax code allows companies to claim a higher expense for tax purposes than it shows on its books. Our subcommittee found that the difference between what U.S. corporations tell the public and what they told the IRS was as much as $61 billion in one year. Facebook's use of this loophole is the most pointed illustration yet of the cost of this loophole. It's difficult to get our minds around a $3 billion tax break for a single corporation. Just how big is it? Well, consider this. In 2009, the most recent year for which IRS data is available, taxpayers from 11 states in our union sent less than $3 billion in individual income tax revenue to the Treasury. How does this make any sense? After all, American taxpayers are going to have to make up for what Facebook's tax deduction costs the Treasury. That $3 billion is either going to come out of the pockets of American families now, or it will add to the deficit that they're going to have to pay for later. What could our nation do with the $3 billion that it will lose when Facebook exploits the stock option loophole? We could reduce the federal deficit. We could pay for programs that protect our seniors and our veterans, put cops on the beat or teachers in the classrooms. $3 billion that Facebook will get in tax deductions would more than triple the budget of the Small Business Administration, which seeks to help American entrepreneurs create jobs and grow the economy. $3 billion would pay for the Pentagon's budget for housing our military families for a full two years. It would pay the budget of the National Institute of Science and Technology for four years. It would more than triple what we plan to spend helping homeless veterans next year. It would pay six times over for the 24 Reaper unmanned aerial vehicles that the Air Force plans to buy next year. Now, some are going to argue that Facebook's tax break <clears throat> is offset by the fact that Mr. Zuckerberg himself, as well as the other executives who are receiving stock options, will pay taxes as individuals. As various news reports indicate, Mr. Zuckerberg will face a substantial tax bill on the $5 billion in compensation that he's about to receive, perhaps in the neighborhood of a $2 billion tax bill. But it is unlikely that the individual taxes that Mr. Zuckerberg pays will offset the tax revenues lost to this loophole. What the Treasury receives from Mr. Zuckerberg, on the one hand, it will return and then some to his company with the other hand. We also should remember that Mr. Zuckerberg's financial future is closely tied to that of his company. The value of the options and his retained interest make that clear. To the extent that his corporation benefits, and as I've shown, Facebook will benefit handsomely from the use of this loophole, Mr. Zuckerberg stands to benefit as well. 
Put simply, some of that big tax bill that he faces right now will come back to him through the corporation that he will still own a huge part of and will control. Now, Madam President, our tax system is built on the principle that businesses as well as individuals ought to help pay our nation's bills. Corporations impose plenty of costs on society from environmental disasters, financial bailouts, product recalls, and more. Businesses also want and need government services, including efficient transportation systems, patent protections, even federal loan guarantees. Paying those costs is why we have a corporate income tax to begin with. Both businesses and individuals are required by law to contribute and should do so to meet their civic obligations and to pay their fair share. There is no reason why Facebook and the other corporations who use this tax loophole should continue to receive these windfall tax deductions. Senator Conrad and I, earlier this month, introduced S2075, the Cut Unjustified Tax Loopholes Act, or Cut Loopholes Act. This bill, similar to the legislation that I've introduced in the past few Congresses, would close this loophole. Under our bill, corporations would no longer be allowed to claim tax deductions for options that are larger than the expense that they report to their shareholders and to people considering buying their stock. It would also subject stock options to the same $1 million cap on deductions for executive compensation that now applies to other forms of compensation. At the same time, and this is important to know, Madam President, it would leave, our bill would leave unchanged the way the law applies to individuals who receive stock options, and it would leave unchanged incentive stock options that are used often by startup companies. We would not affect that. The stock option loophole should have been closed long before Mr. Zuckerberg's extraordinarily lucrative options became public. But surely the case of Facebook illustrates to the Senate, to the Congress, and to the American people that we must close this loophole. I've spoken today about one corporate tax loophole, but there are many, many more. The momentum has never been stronger for tax reform. It brings more fairness to the tax code, restores revenue loss to unjustified tax loopholes, reduces the deficit, and protects important priorities. And I look forward to working with our colleagues and with the administration to turn that momentum into real reform. Madam President, I